for those that are the good ones that are back in the room, uh, they're not lingering around having coffee. As we said, we will start at four o'clock precisely, which is what we're doing. I expect that people will start coming in, but I would not want to delay things because we have online speakers in this session and I do not want to have them waiting. So um, this is the fifth session of the Third International Conference on Mar Marine and Maritime Spatial Planning under the title Transboundary Cooperation, a very important issue. And for this, we have a very good uh, array again of speakers and co-moderators. So my co-moderator for this session is Sarah Mahadeo from the World Maritime University. Sarah, please join us up here. And our rapporteur for this session is Riku Varjopurov from the Finnish Environmental Institute. Riku, please join us as well. Thank you very much. And our speakers are in physical presence Bettina Kepler from Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency of Germany. Welcome, please, Bettina, join us. We have Zelika Skarcic, if I pronounce it right. Uh, we've known Zelika for a long time, and I think I was always pronouncing her name so-so. So thank you very much, Zelika, for being with us. You can applaud. You know, people are coming up here. Uh, then we'll have uh, on remote connection Abdullahia Digana from Abidjan, from the Abidjan Convention. We have by physical presence Timothy Andrew from the Nairobi Convention. Timothy, please join us. We will have also by uh, remote connection Wenxi Zhu from the IOC Subcommission for the Western Pacific. And uh, also we have as a speaker Susanna de Beauville Scott from the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Susanna, please join us up here. Thank you very much all. Uh, I don't think I need to say much about this uh, issue of the transboundary collaboration. The only thing I want to say before I hand over the uh, moderation to Sarah is that in this session what we will do is we will hear from representative of reg representatives of regional organizations that are actively supporting MSP and they will share with us experiences and ideas. And I think this is the most enriching part because these are people that are doing things in practice and we can all gain from, from having their point of view. So Sarah, if you would like to take over from me, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Spiros. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today as co-moderator of this session. Um, I am one of those uh, Erasmus Mundus alumni. Um, five years ago, I was at the second international conference in Paris. I was invited as a student, and I was the only participant from the Caribbean island states. This time around, however, I'm not alone, and we have conference participants as well as speakers from the region, so I take the opportunity to welcome colleagues from the Caribbean region. Um, in this session, we will hear from speakers on transboundary cooperation, which is an important part of the MSP process, as we aim to manage mobile natural resources as well as ecosystems and human activities which traverse maritime administrative juris jurisdictions. At yesterday's forum, uh, we had a range of participants from around the world sharing experiences on a variety of questions related to transboundary cooperation, including mechanisms for cooperation, the types of institutions which support cooperation, as well as challenges or barriers to cooperation and potential solutions. I will attempt to summarize a few of the main points that came out of the discussions. Um, so commonly identified barriers to cooperation um, include those that relate to differences among countries, such as language, culture, planning systems, stage of planning, as well as planning objectives and priorities. Um, additionally, the relationship between countries is critical, and we had several examples of um, in sea basins, which are geopolitically complex and where they are either terrestrial and or maritime disputes, and cooperation is a challenge as governments are often unwilling to even engage. Um, in the developing context in particular, capacity challenges were cited as a barrier to effective transboundary working. And capacity is a broad term and we take it to mean relating to human, financial and institutional capacity. Participants yesterday also identified enablers of cooperation as well as gave several recommendations. So regional organizations which facilitate working among countries have a critical role to play 
And among our panel today, we will hear from representatives from a few of these and the work they are doing to advance MSP among the countries in their region. Recommendations given include leveraging already established platforms for cooperation, such as through the work of sectoral initiatives under, for example, sectors such as transport and fisheries, developing a joint roadmap or regional framework, as well as aiming to institutionalize MSP practices to support transboundary cooperation. Um, maybe in, for example, the EU context, you have well institutionalized MSP practices, but um, typically in developing contexts, we have project-based MSP, um, which does not support effective transboundary working as it does not allow you to build trust and relationships which are required for effective working across borders. So to conclude, um, a lesson from the sea basins, which are perhaps most advanced in transboundary cooperation for MSP, the North and Baltic Seas. From them, we learned that after some time and trust and relationships have been developed and we have a fairly good understanding of our neighbors, we can move to less formal mechanisms such as community of practices and Nico spoke a lot about the community of practices. So community of practices can facilitate transboundary cooperation for MSP. But this is, um, I would say, in sea basins, which are fairly advanced. I will end here, and I look forward to the presentations from our speakers and the discussion later. Without delay, I invite our first speaker, Bettina Kepler. Um, she's a, marine a maritime spatial planner from the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency of Germany, and also a member of the Helcom Vassab MSP Working Group. Welcome, Bettina. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to this meeting. Um, yeah, first I want to stress that um, well, we're not planning in, in isolation when we do maritime spatial planning. Each uh, decision we do, we, have, we, uh, we um, take in our planning processes, will have an impact and if it will affect um, our, not only our sea users in the national level, but also uh, our neighbors and pe people who are using, from outside, who are using our sea areas. So we have to be aware of that. And um, this is, uh, yeah, a very uh, important um, reason for collaboration in the sea area. It doesn't matter if it's a small or a, a large share of the sea area. Um, so collaboration is key. Yeah, so um, I'm looking at some transboundary consultation issues from our, um, um, from, from our process, uh, our last uh, processes and, um, um, and the role uh, of the um, Baltic Sea uh, collaboration um, community. So um, when we started in 2009 issuing our first maritime special plans, there was hardly any um, MSP in place there, and uh, no, I, neither in the North Sea or the Baltic Sea, uh, so where we have uh, shares, as you see on our current plan. Um, so uh, international cooperation or collaboration or, or consultation with our neighbors was very hard because uh, they didn't have an, a comprehensive uh, um, um, set of objectives for their sea areas, which they could put into, onto the table. So it, it was a bit hard to, to really um, get along with uh, on, on these, these uh, meetings. So there weren't so many, and it wasn't much we, we uh, received from them as an informed con consultation. Um, no, so just sorry. Um, from th yeah, up at what happened after 2009. After in 2009, the first the comprehensive MSP project, the EU-funded project, started, and it was the first in a string of MSP uh, projects funded by the EU, um, by Interreg or uh, the the, the Tumare. And um, in, in parallel, there was an institutionalized um, um, working group, the Halcom Vasap uh, Maritime um, Spatial Planning Working Group, installed in, uh, in 2010. Um, it's a formal, formal working group um, con uh, combining the, the secretariats of uh, HALCOM and, and the VASAP, the spatial planning um, 
collaboration in the Baltic Sea, and uh, we uh, all, with the representatives of all um, um, Baltic Sea states, and uh, we are, um, we are since then working together on all kinds of issues uh, regarding MSP in the Baltic Sea, and um, and, and we're, it's all intertwined with the um, with the Baltic Sea uh, MSP projects as well. So there's a kind of overlap, and there are some flagship projects. Um, supported by the Herkom Wasser uh, MSP Working Group. So when we started uh, our new um, cycle of MSP, um, which the result of which you see here, then uh, was uh, uh, take, uh, um, went into effect last year in, in September. Um, so we could build on a much more um, you know, completely different kind of uh, situation uh, with regard to MSP and the Baltic Sea. So there was a level of understanding, there was a level of, of uh, work uh, having been done in each of the, the neighboring countries. And so when we started the, the, the um, uh, consultation process, here you see the whole process and the red um, boarded um, uh, columns there, there is, um, these are the uh, stages of, of consultation, which we did nationally, internationally, and uh, we received a lot of, of uh, interventions and, and uh, comments um, during these phases. It was much different uh, compared to the first cycle, the MSP cycle. And um, so when you look here at what you see here on, in the Balti southern Baltic Sea, you see our uh, highlighted our Baltic Sea, um, uh, current Baltic Sea um, MSP, and then uh, you, and, and you also see the MSPs in, in the German uh, territorial waters. And then we highlighted uh, some issues, uh, planning issues like shipping and, um, and offshore wind development from our neighboring countries' MSPs. So you see it's a very cramped. Our MSP is a squeeze between all these um, neighboring um, sea areas, so it's, it's key that we're working together, um, for example, with these overarching um, um, planning issues um, with uh, shipping, with the most important shipping routes running through our sea areas here, and, and extensive uh, offshore wind development. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I don't know if this works, or because it's a video, can I just work? No, it doesn't work. How do I start this? Is this possible? Oh no, no. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, IAS data, and this this uh, the kind of gimmick where you see all the, the ships moving on this video, and this has been developed by by a contractor uh, in in the uh, context of shipping study we we uh, commissioned, and um, so. There, you don't see any borders on there, and it, it's not important borders. It's important to secure these shipping routes, the, the very important shipping routes together, and you have to do it in your national uh, framework of MSP to, uh, and, and to have to talk about it, uh, how to secure these areas, uh, sea areas then. Yeah, so um, Coming to, to the end, this is uh, just an overview of the documents we, we, we published uh, for, for our current MSP, and we published them also in English and uh, on some of them in Polish languages, uh, language and then Danish, and you might access all this information here. And um, you also see how published in Halcom Base Maps. Uh, base Maps is a very important product uh, which um, is, is being developed in the, in the um, Halcom, uh, in the subgroup of the Halcom Wasser MSP Working Group, the Data Expert Group. And, and you see we were kind of the avant garde with regard to this, this data. MSP data, and which has, uh, and if you had uh, had a look on, on the EMOTNET uh, web portal, you saw that all the all the, the Baltic Sea states having their their um, MSP represented there because we already did this uh, in base maps. Yes, and thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you for that, Bettina. Um, uh, we move straight to our next speaker, um, who is Jelka Skarzic. Um, she is the director of UNEP Paprak for the Mediterranean Sea. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. 
So uh, uh, I will speak about transboundary cooperation in the Mediterranean within the Barcelona Convention system, Barcelona Convention for the Protection of the Mediterranean Sea and Coast. Uh, when we talk about Mediterranean, we talk about semi-closed sea basin, which has the maximum width of 800 kilometers from the southernmost Croatian shore to Libya. And also the narrowest part is the Gibraltar Strait, only 13 kilometers. So it is obvious that we need sort of transboundary cooperation. We also talk about 21 different countries, countries having different backgrounds, different geopolitical situation, different economic situation, social, uh, religious, cultural, cultural context. Uh, and in the case of the Barcelona Convention, we also have an additional, additional contracting parties, party, which is the European Commission. So those are the reasons for transboundary cooperation in MSP, on MSP in the Mediterranean. Uh, when we talk about transboundary cooperation within the Barcelona Convention system, we refer first, first of all to what is definition of common objectives, common visions, also uh, preparing guidelines and giving some, uh, putting, putting all the parties, whether they are EU member states or not, uh, to a similar starting position when it comes to, prepare, uh, to preparing uh, their, their marine, maritime spatial plans. Uh, we also use another term in the Barcelona Convention for cooperation between and among countries, which is cross-border cooperation. And this one refers more to uh, preparation of, uh, uh, of plans for neighboring countries or regions, plans that can be uh, prepared uh, either the coastal or, or marine, maritime uh, that can be prepared as a single, single product. Uh, Somebody said this morning, let's start, let's start with why. So why do we deal with MSP within the Barcelona Convention and UNEP map? First of all, there is a legally binding regional document, Protocol on Integrated Coastal Zone Management for the Mediterranean, uh, that defines the, the geographical scope of its, of its implementation landward and seaward. Seaward is up to the external limit of territorial waters. So it's obvious that while, de with, uh, while dealing with integrated coastal zone management, we also have to take into consideration maritime spatial planning. That is why uh, in 2017, contracting parties to the Barcelona Convention have adopted as a legally binding, again, document, the conceptual framework for MSP, a document that uh, is largely, that has been uh, inspired largely by the EU directive on MSP, but also tailor-made for the Mediterranean needs, uh, needs and situation. Lately, we have, uh, we have uh, also prepared uh, an interactive, interactive uh, workspace for marine spa maritime spatial planning in, 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 in the Mediterranean. Uh, I invite you to have a look at this platform, which provides a lot of good examples, uh, explains the process, and also, uh, also provides a lot of tools for implementation of MSP. This platform uh, deals with all relevant, relevant issues for marine spatial planning in, in the Mediterranean. First of all, it explains why the ecosystem approach it, uh, it uh, gives examples of tools to be used to, 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 to ensure that the ecosystem approach is properly, properly applied. Then also uh, we deal a lot with uh, something that is obvious and inevitable these days, which is the climate change, and its impacts on, on coast and marine, marine, marine environment. And also uh, we insist a lot on land sea interactions because this is something that brings together coastal and, and, uh, and, um, uh, and marine planning. So what are the guiding princi principles in, for, ICZ, for, sorry, for MSP in the, in, the, in the Barcelona Convention system? First of all, this is the ecosystem approach. Ecosystem approach is uh, the guiding principles of the entire work of the Barcelona Convention. 
and when it comes to applying it uh, uh, properly within, within the marine spatial planning, it is obvious that this, this, this is hardly a matter of one single country. So we need transboundary cooperation. Notwithstanding the need for a pan-Mediterranean approach for, for MSP, we also recognize the specificities of different regions in the sub-regions in the Mediterranean. For instance, it is difficult that uh, Adriatic or Alboran Sea will have the same, the same priorities, the same, uh, the same uh, vision, the same, uh, uh, that they will be using the same, the same tools. So this is something that we very much insist on. And we also insist on an adaptive approach, which is really adapted to the single, sing every single, single situation in the Mediterranean. Uh, Multiscalar multi approach is really something that is necessary if we want to have a healthy, healthy, uh, uh, healthy uh, transboundary cooperation. Ecosystem continuity and uh, also uh, some inter international nature of some of the, of the maritime activities uh, call for uh, Mediterranean integrated coherent approaches to planning and management. But those approaches should be harmonized with those that come at the national level or subnational level. So those plans have to be have to be have to be uh, harmonized and really integrated. Uh, this brings us also to, to multiscalar governance systems because uh, uh, besides the, 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 the context provided by the Barcelona Convention and other international fora for, for marine spatial planning in the Mediterranean, we also have to think how to, how to organize them at the national and subnational level properly. And finally, we think that uh, the easiest way in dealing with marine spatial planning, especially for those country of the Med countries of the Mediterranean which are not bound by EU, EU directives, is to start with priorities. And priorities are very often environmental protection. So making a network of marine protected area, areas, uh, working with them, with them in first place, or also tackling some very delicate issue of areas beyond national jurisdiction is something that we start with to involve all the actors, all the sectors, and all the stakeholders. So that would be to start about our cooperation in the, in the, in the Mediterranean with regard to MSP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelka, for sharing the experience of PAFRA from the Med. Um, our third speaker is joining us remotely. Um, do we have Abdullahi online? Yes, we do. So Abdullahi Diagana is the coordinator of the Abidjan Convention, and we will hear all about what they are doing in West Africa. Over to you, Abdullahi. Um, thank you. Uh, should I share my uh, presentation from here? Or are you going to do it from there? The technicians here will share your presentation. And thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you for uh, this uh, opportunity you gave us uh, to uh, present what we are doing in the Abidjan Convention region, our related uh, cooperation, transboundary cooperation related activities. Uh, I would like to introduce the Abidjan Convention, which is a legal binding uh, treaty uh, adopted by the uh, government in 1981 and uh, entered, uh, entered into force in 1984. We have 22 countries um, on uh, 14,000 kilometers from uh, Mauritania to South Africa. And, uh, we have three large marine ecosystems, Benguela, Canaries, and uh, Guinea uh, current. And uh, we cover the marine environment, coastal zones, and related uh, inline, inline, inland waters falling within the jurisdiction of the state uh, of all this uh, coastline, Atlantic coastline from the, uh, for, of the African continent. Slide. Uh, this is not so the one I shared yesterday. This is not the good. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. This is not the. 
the good uh, PowerPoint, the presentation. If you allow me to share the mine. Um, is it possible, is it possible to have the presentation shared by the speaker? Sorry. Shared by the speaker. Okay, so 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 I will continue without yes. uh, with, without yeah. yeah without the, the the PowerPoint. So so the one you have is not relevant. Uh, so what are we doing uh, on the regional uh, framework? Uh, I I I'm going to present uh, examples of out, 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 outputs we have in the Abidjan Convention Secretariat. We completed our revitalization uh, process and we finished it uh, two years ago. Uh, we developed a report on state of the cost on the and the environment and the marine environmental uh, state. We have in, the, in our region five protocols, uh, one dealing with uh, cooperating in combating pollution in case of emergency signed in 1984. We also have a second one, uh, the LBSA uh, protocol. We signed in, signed in 2012. Uh, we have a third one, oil and gas offshore activities. Uh, another one on integrated coastal zone management. And uh, the last one is on sustainable management of uh, mangrove ecosystem. All these uh, three last uh, protocol uh, mentioned have been signed in 2019 in Abidjan. We are working on two additional protocols, one on uh, pol uh, plastic pollution and a second one on uh, marine protected uh, areas. Uh, the thematic we are working on, we published, uh, we have publication and studies on pollution, BBNGs, IUU, biodiversity loss, ocean governance and uh, capacity building. Um, what is, let's say our, um, vision of MSP. What, first of all, what we are doing is building capacities. We, we assisted our parties to build capacities and develop MSP document, mainly in uh, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, together with uh, Grid Arandal uh, in the framework of the Mami Water Project. Uh, we also signed agreement with technical partners to assist uh, six of our parties together with uh, UNEP, OACP, and the European Union uh, in the framework of the ACP MEA's uh, program. Uh, the MSP for us, uh, the process uh, should be inclusive. It's an inclusive uh, process to bring together all the stakeholders and to manage marine and coastal space to prevent uh, conflicts of use. We, we also enabled parties to benefit from the potential of the blue economy in a sustainable manner um, by providing environmental, environmentally sound uh, information, services, communication, and strengthening the capacities on information management and uh, assessment. Uh, finally, we, we do things that uh, we had to make scientific knowledge and we still have to make this scientific knowledge credible and, uh, and uh, um, accessible to the public and uh, decision makers for sustainable uh, development. Uh, to finish uh, the way forward, uh, I think we need to develop as mentioned by, by, by uh, colleagues here and uh, the former, uh, former uh, speaker, we need to develop technical cooperation between partners. Cooperation is, is, is really important on these issues. And if I, uh, when I'm talking about cooperation, I'm talking about cooperation amongst our parties, but also uh, around the Atlantic uh, Ocean. We also need to, uh, to mobilize uh, resources to extend the experience to more party parties because a lot of them are asking for capacity building on MSP, but resources are not enough. Thank you a lot and uh, thank you, thank you, bye.
Thank you, Abdullahi, for sharing your experience of the Mami Water Project. Uh, we look forward to hearing more in the discussion afterwards. Um, we are a few minutes um, behind, so I remind speakers to keep to the time, five minutes. Um, our next speaker is Timothy Andrew. He is a senior program manager with the convention uh, working in the Western Indian Ocean. So I invite him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, um, and good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to the organizers for giving us this uh, platform to share some experiences from, from our part of the world. Um, the title of the presentation is Preparing for a Transboundary Cooperation in MSP. Um, it's, it's, the wording has been chosen quite carefully because we are some way behind some of the other um, regions of the world in terms of regional or transboundary cooperation um, in, in this particular field. Um, having said that, we've been making some preparations um, and some good progress towards um, this, this cooperation. We just go to the next slide. Um, it was mentioned earlier that we should also be using um, and making and building upon um, established uh, mechanisms in which to embed MSP and just as our friend from the Abidjan Convention reported, um, there are several of these conventions that have been already, already um, implemented for, for a few decades now. We heard from the Mediterranean, um, the Barcelona Convention and the Abidjan Convention, but we in the Western Indian Ocean have the Nairobi Convention, which pro already provides a legal framework and platform for this regional collaboration between countries um, around area issues to do with protection, management and development of our region. And that really does focus on allowing countries to collaboratively look at common problems around the large marine ecosystems of, of our region and uh, try to make solutions to those problems. The vision is a partnership between governments, uh, civil society and the private sector um, and working towards a prosperous Western Indian Ocean in all forms in terms of um, uh, sustainable environment as well as unlocking potential blue economy opportunities for the future. The convention has received the support of the 10 countries um, that are party to it uh, through several decisions dating back to uh, the first in 2015 around um, area-based management tools such as marine spatial planning in support of blue economy development. Um, there's been several other decisions since then. Um, in 2018, again, it was reiterated that um, we as the secretariat to the convention should promote um, the use of these tools such as MSP. And this was again um, emphasized in our last conference of parties in 2001, that was last 2021 last year. So we have a mandate to go ahead. Um, and through that mandate um, and working very closely with partners, I must emphasize that the convention is a partnership program, as I said, beyond the countries, but with, with several civil society players as, as well as, as the private sector. So we have been asked um, as the Secretariat to look at um, ways of promoting MSP. Some of the actions that we are doing are what we've done is established a technical working group um, on marine spatial planning. The countries have uh, each nominated two representatives to sit on that body. Um, and so far, it's been mostly virtual interactions uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, this was set up in 2020, so in the middle of, of that, that time. Um, in collaboration with this technical working group, we were asked to facilitate the development of a framework on MSP to help guide um, countries towards this, this ultimate goal of, of having a, a region-wide MSP. Um, I just must emphasize that 
many of the countries are still at a very early stage in their MSP process. Um, and there are other countries, I must just emphasize Seychelles, for example, South Africa, um, who have made really good progress and is opportunity to learn from those countries um, with the other, through sharing with other countries of the region. We have been also asked by the countries to ensure that the capacity is, is in place to, to uh, support both national and regional MSP processes. And we've developed a very close relationship with our Swedish partners through the Swedish Agency for Marine and, Marine and, and Water Management um, to develop and to deliver a capacity development program over the next few years to support um, this MSP framework that has been developed um, in the region. So the MSP framework provides, as I said, this guidance for working towards a, a region wide spatial plan. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done at a national level to get there. So this capacity development is starting at the national level um, and looking at, at MSP in different scales. Um, SWAM is also helping us with um, developing a tool that is based on experiences from, from the, the Swedish MSP process, the symphony. So we have a wire symphony tool now to support um, MSP in terms of uh, cumulative impact assessment. Um, then as part of our work program for the convention, we also are supporting various national level activities, depending on the, the needs of the countries and what they have expressed as their priorities um, around MSP. Um, for example, in Kenya, we are helping the country with um, a blue economy assessment of which MSP is a part, um, hopefully then to, to assist with the development of, of policy to support uh, MSP in that country. Um, there's various county level or local level MSP processes in some of the counties in, in Kenya, in, uh, for example, Kalifi. There is um, a multiple county program in Kenya as well, um, supported by the EU called the Go Blue Project, which is just starting now. Uh, MSP is a very big part of that. MSP has also been incorporated in transboundary work um, between countries. I think it was mentioned that in the German context, there was this cross-border uh, collaboration as well. Um, so we do have an activity around the transboundary conservation area between Tanzania and Kenya, where MSP has been um, incorporated as well. And then South Africa is showing interest and has started some work that we are supporting through the convention on land sea interface issues um, in one of the provinces of that country. So many of these national level activities um, are also including capacity development um, at, at that level that hopefully through bodies such as this technical working group on MSP can contribute to the regional process, which, as I said, is a longer term goal, um, but that is ultimately where we want to go in terms of, of um, MSP in the Western Indian Ocean. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I will continue this kind of um, this, uh, this direction of discussion in the question uh, session that follows. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Sam, for sharing the experience of the Convention in the Western Indian Ocean. Um, our fifth, fifth speaker is joining us remotely once again, um, Wen Ji Xu, the head of IOC Subcommission for the Western Pacific. Do we have... Them? Right. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'm online. Yes, a uh, very good afternoon, uh, I think, uh, dear colleagues and friends in Barcelona. I think... Uh, if you don't mind, I, I, I wish the, you know, the organizer to display my slides. Right? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you know, transboundary cooperation has never been easy. 
right? This is also the case to the Western Pacific region that I am come from. I think, uh, you know, the Western Pacific region, IOC, Westpac is a regional intergovernmental body of IOC, you know, responsible for promoting ocean knowledge in the Western Pacific for marine environmental protection, for ocean governance and sustainable development. I think, uh, you know, including all East Asia, Southeast Asia, some small island country in the Pacific and also some are country in the Eastern Indian Ocean in order to, you know, study the connection between the two ocean basins. So the marine ISP, uh, MSP, I think it really matters to the Western Pacific simply because, uh, you know, most of country in the region are truly maritime nations with a considerable stake in the ocean. Highly popular, I think a region home to almost one third of global population and rapidly developing because this region, I think since the beginning of this new millennium has been considered as the, you know, the growth engine of the world economy, right? And also this region is also home to their, you know, the highest level of marine biodiversity in this world. So associated with all escalating human activities, I think all coast area in Asia are facing a very much, I mean, severe and increasing range of stress and the thoughts, eutrophication, pollution, overfishing, and vulnerability to marine disaster and also climate change. As you know, I think most are mega city, that means city with more than 10 million population, most are mega city has been located in the Western Pacific countries. So in that sense, I think uh, considering the current or, uh, you know, very over exploiting situation and also the very high demand for sustainable development, the marine spatial planning really provide a very practical tool. I mean, science-based public participatory tools towards our ecosystem-based management to protect the marine environment and the resources on one hand, and also ensure the ocean sustainability on the other hand. So next, please. So uh, next, please. So I think although, you know, compared to other regions, you know, presented by uh, previous, previous slide, please. Uh, compared to other regions, I think uh, uh, there are more than 90 countries, right? Has been, you know, completed or developing MSP within their national jurisdiction. But in our region, Western Pacific region, I think relatively less Asia and also any country have put MSP on their national agenda. So even many countries in this region, MSP are still at a very early stage. So for example, I think China may be one of those countries who started developing MSP at a very early stage. I think in 1989, they call it marine function zoning. So currently they have completed three generation of MSP. And also Korea also, you know, just in 2019, they elected marine spatial planning, I mean, for national plan. And also I think by the end of this year, they support to complete finish or MSP at provincial level. So this is maybe the two countries, I think of either, you know, a rapid development of MSP in the East Asia. So when we look at Southeast Asia, I think Indonesia may be the, the country that has been, you know, developing SME quite rapidly over the last 10 to 15 years. I think now they are go to their from national level, provincial level, even some local level. I think are uh, in a very good trend, you know, for MSB development. But this is not the similar story for all other countries in this region, like Thailand, Cambodia, the Philippines, let alone our small island developing countries. I think uh, although MSP is uh, stimulated by sectoral or integrated national policy, but currently there's no MSP at the national level, with their, their practice limited on a pilot level. So this is some example I show here. The development of SP varies greatly from one country to another. Next slide, please. So. With such kind of situation, as I emphasized earlier, and also very much inspired by the MSP Global project, I think there, yes, MSP Global 1.0. Many countries in this region 
you know, express their demand for accelerating, I mean, accelerating MMFC in this region. So based on to serve that demand, the IOC subcommission for the Western PAC developed the ocean decade action named Accelerating Marine Spatial Planning in the Western Pacific and as, 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 uh, uh, adjacent regions. So maybe some colleagues may not be very aware of the regional subsidy body of IOC has been doing. Actually, if you consider what IOC doing at global level, you can have quickly have a, you know, an idea how the subcommission has been doing in the region. So the UN decade, I think indeed also provide a lot of good opportunity you know, for the regional stakeholders, not only marine scientific community, but also policymakers and other stakeholders to work together to advance their scientific and technology development, working together with our stakeholders to really provide marine science solution. I think this is also the case for the MSP. So the MSP in the region aims to capitalize. I think we are not going to do something separately we will certainly serve the regional component of the MSP global projects, building on that project, building on that kind of international gap to further promote and accelerate MSP in this region by building our sustainable regional mechanism. We call it MSP um, regional forum as a regular forum, you know, bring stakeholders together to exchange their ideas and also to engage stakeholder and also engage policymakers and also you know to develop cooperative opportunity and also further adapt and demonstrate MSP international gap at a different level, particular national level and also a regional level and a national level and the local a provincial level and the local level. So we have been you know working closely with our all relevant, I mean, MSP practitioner in the region. So we are going to have a forced regional dialogue, you know, We're working together with her closely with her IOC Paris, you know, to, to engage all stakeholders in the region and deliberating our regional roadmap for SP over the next eight to 10 years. Next slide, please. So last but not least, I would say uh, again, the transboundary a transboundary cooperation has never been easy, particular in this Western Pacific. As you know, many of them are very big maritime nation with a very great vast sea areas and many maritime boundary hasn't yet been stimulated. But I think uh, as I mentioned again, or other speakers emphasize the mutual trust and also long-term cooperation and a strong ownership would be the key, you know, to uh, you know, accelerating uh, uh, MSP in this region. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I think uh, I give back the floor. Thank to you, you. Wenji. Thank you very much. Um, we are a little behind, so I immediately invite our final speaker of the session, Ms. Susanna de Beauville scott Susanna is the project manager of the regional organization um, in the Eastern Caribbean called the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Good afternoon to all. The Organization of Eastern Caribbean States would like to thank the organizers for this invitation. And before I start, I just have a question for the audience present here in, in, in the room. How many of you have visited the Caribbean, either for, through work or just for pleasure? Show of hands. Okay, more numbers than I expected, thank you. <laughs> So just to start with a little context, the OECS, or Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, was established in 1981 by way of the Treaty of Bastyr. This, this treaty was revised in 2010 to form the OECS Economic Union. The OECS comprises 11 member states, six independent countries, three UK overseas territories, and two um, French overseas territories. Under the treaty, the uh, member states shall coordinate, harmonize, and under undertake joint action and pursue joint policies on matters related to several areas, including on matters related to the sea. 
The OECS recognizes that meaningful stakeholder engagement across the states is required in the management and cooperation of the dynamically interconnected marine spaces within and among its member states. And as such, in 2013, 2013, the authority, which is the heads of, of government, endorsed the Eastern Caribbean Regional Ocean Policy, or ECROP for short. And of note is that this policy has an outcome number five, which is that coastal and marine spatial plans are adopted. In 2021, so that as of last year, the OECS completed coastal and marine spatial plans for five of its member states. The scope of each of these plans go from the coast out to the outer limits of the economic exclusive zone. The implementation of these plans is being driven by national ocean governance committees, which are multi-sectoral in nature and tasked with coordinating and advising on ocean governance matters at the country level. Moving up a, a level, at the OECS level, an OECS ocean governance team ensures that engagement and coordination happens at that level, and it comprises leading members of each of the national ocean governance committees. Priorities that emanate from this OEC, the meetings of the OECS ocean governance team are taken up at the OECS Council of Ministers. That's so we moving up again and with furtherance at the level of the OECS authority um, as appropriate. So that's how our decisions move up until it reaches the authority, which are the heads of government where you have that um, final decision on any joint policies, et cetera. So to continue to encourage and foster transparency cooperation, an OECS regional marine spatial planning framework has also been prepared, that's of last year. And this is going through the levels of approval at this stage. This provides an overarching framework that supports alignment and coordination among the member states. Of note is that this framework is based on the vision and principles set out in the Eastern Caribbean Regional um, Ocean Policy. The Transboundary marine spa um, spatial planning issues for cooperation that are included in this framework are structured into eight thematic areas, and these are listed here, so I won't bother to speak on each of these. Um, but it is expected that the transboundary cooperation on, on marine spatial matters will be facilitated through existing systems in our region. Now, I'll just give one example here, the OECS Assembly the OECS Assembly facilitates harmonization of policies. The Assembly brings together both the government and opposition members of, parli of, par of the parliament and leg legislatures of the 11 member states to consider and seek common solutions to issues that affect the, re the, the, the region or the OECS subregion. And so just in conclusion to state the very nature of the organization of in, um, Eastern Caribbean states lens way for transboundary cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And congratulations on the plans. Um, I thank all speakers for the in interventions. It's always interesting to hear the experiences from different parts of the world, and we've heard from many different sea basins today. Um, I hope we can catch up some time in this uh, discussion, and I immediately want to kick it off with a question to Bettina. Um, perhaps amongst all the geographies represented here today, um, Germany has the most experience with transboundary cooperation, working for many years in the no North and Baltic Seas. And it's a relatively um, maybe a basic or easy or simple question, but what would you say are the key ingredients or critical factors for effective transboundary cooperation for MSP? I think one of the most important things is to build up trust among, among the neighboring countries with regard to MSP, uh, between the MSP authorities and uh, also stakeholders. And um, 
Yeah, and, and it's crucial to, to develop a common understanding of MSP among these authorities and stakeholders. And even if you have to acknowledge that there are differences um, due to national priorities for that sea areas and uh, different legal frameworks. But I remember within the first um, project I worked in, in 2009, 2010, we had a, we had a, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, we had a, um, a meeting, of one of the first meetings, and then one of the, of the, the other country's representatives said, hmm, what is MSP? We're in the MSP project, yes? But, but we don't know what MSP is. So we started from scratch uh, within the first project and then went on um, to, to develop this common understanding. And I think what's important is also this continuous dialogue and exchange. And you have to provide the resources for that. For example, through projects, through funding, uh, um, for uh, projects and, and events and for the staff that's working in these projects. Um, and these in, in the Baltic Sea, uh, and now the um, North Sea, those projects have been very, very helpful and uh, we thank uh, the EU very much that we were able to, to work uh, uh, so, so long, over such a long time within these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bettina for that, so I will summarize and I will help Riku a little bit. Trust, common understanding, resources and the regional projects. Um, a similar question to Abdullahi online. Um, what have been the critical success factors for transboundary cooperation for the African Atlantic countries? Um, you spoke in your presentation about the Mamiwata project and perhaps you can tell us what within that project was most impactful for, co for cooperation among the countries. Thank you. Uh, in fact, the presentation was uh, on all the Abidjan Convention activities uh, and Bambi Water Project was only one experience among others. Uh, we, we, we had a uh, Waka project funded by the World Bank, uh, the MEA's ACP3 uh, funded by the, by the uh, European Union and so on and so on. Uh, if I should summarize what um, we had a lot of challenges, as Bettina mentioned at the at the beginning. Uh, countries and experts was was uh, asking, what is uh, <laughs> the MSP? And w when we we started uh, organizing capacity building uh, sessions, they discovered that in fact they, they they was practicing the MSP without the name. Uh, um, the ingredients, if I have to, 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 to mention the ingredients for a, a successful policy, so how to overcome some struggles or, or challenges. Uh, first, there must be um, a real political will uh, and um, a good understanding of the issues and interest in the countries uh, involved in the, in the process. Uh, and secondly, there must be fluid communication between the decision makers of the countries involved, and it's not always granted. Uh, then uh, an inclusive uh, process with the involvement of uh, all stakeholders is needed. Uh, it also requires significant human and, and, and financial resources. All of this, of course, will not be effective without good involvement of, uh, of local, local communities. I, I can develop further, but uh, as the time is, uh, is, uh, is uh, limited, I, I will stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Abdullahi, for that. Um, so um, maybe some um, other ingredients. Uh, so the political will was one that was added here from the developing context. Um, I will go immediately to the second question, and this is for Tim and Susanna. Um, both of them spoke in their presentations about regional MSP frameworks. And um, I'd like them to expand upon that. Um, can you describe how we might leverage existing mechanisms um, to, to implement these regional MSP frameworks? Okay, so, so I did mention that um, for us, for the regional marine spatial planning framework, it is expected that we, are, we use existing 
um, mechanisms or systems. Um, because establishing new systems would really place a challenge to our already challenged countries with limited resources, as well, we're SIDS. And so, as I, as I indicated, there are a number of existing systems that can assist with transport or facilitate transboundary. And I'll just kind of run through a couple of them in case you, you missed it. So, for example, we have the National Ocean Governance Committees. And these have, are, are represented on the OECS um, Ocean Governance Team. So that is an intergovernmental agent um, um, mechanism right there. And above that level, you have the Council of Ministers. Our Council of Ministers meet on different thematic areas, fisheries, marine resources, ocean governance, et cetera, would be one area that they would meet on. And any priority areas that come up through these systems would be raised again for endorsement at our OECS authority level. And if we're looking at policies for, or, or um, legislation, we'd be looking at the OECS assembly that deals with that. So just to just note in, um, 19, in the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s, we harmonized legislation on fisheries. In the 1990s, we harmonized legislation on waste management and um, as of last year and this year we are moving to update these pieces of legislation some of these countries are still using so that it can address these can address some of the emerging issues like plastics etc so we, we are using these systems as a matter of necessity great uh, thank you susanna but just a, a quick follow-up any any regional institutions that you would look at um Yes, yes, definitely. I didn't want to go into those because then I'd have to start defining. But above the, above that level, we would be looking at wider wider Caribbean um, um, systems or mechanisms in place. For example, the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, the um, other organs of the Caribbean Community, or what we call CARICOM um, 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 level. There there are many, and even inter um, governmental agencies that deal with um, the. Um, international agreements etc in, in in the region so there are many of these existing bodies are the easiest the if you were to establish anything new you'd literally be stepping on toes of of the mandates of existing organizations so that's the best way to go through existing institutions thanks. great thank you for that susanna tim yeah thanks uh, just to add on to that i think that the in, in all the regions that we work in, there's, there's, there are bodies that have been in place for some time um, where that trust that was talked about earlier has been built up. Um, and that does take many years to develop. So one has to capitalize on that. Um, in terms of our process in the Western Indian Ocean, um, we see the, the Nairobi Convention framework as, as a really important way of promoting um, approaches and tools such as MSP. I think the, the important thing for the such conventions is their convening powers um, and the ability to get countries to agree on particular ways of doing business, um, which in itself doesn't solve the problem in the, in the end run, in the, in the long run, but at least provides that political will at the ministerial level to to um, go in a particular direction and and i think that that's really where we need to in terms of regional cooperation make use of of these existing um bodies the other th other important thing is that these regional organizations have the capacity to raise or, or to uh, mobilize resources to support particular actions at a regional level so that's that's really important to um, kind of build on uh, into the work programs of of these these regional uh, initiatives um, and then just one final point the we are talking about it at lunchtime actually the importance of um, regional bodies being able to play an port, important role in, coordination, in co coordinating international um, partners and support to ensure that the regional priorities uh, for that particular area of the world are addressed. So 
the regional bodies know their constituencies, they know what countries want to, to do, the directions they want to do, um, and one size doesn't fit all, so we need to be quite specific on how we tailor those programs. Um, yeah, and then just endorsement of documents such as frameworks around MSP um, through the, the, in our case, convention structures. Um, we're hoping to have our framework around MSP endorsed um, next year um, by the Conference of Parties. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you to both Tim and Susanna. We look forward to following up the developments regarding the implementation of these regional frameworks. Um, the final question goes to both uh, Wenji and Shelka, who both, I think, um, raised how challenging their particular contexts were regarding transboundary cooperation. So I would first go to Wenji online. Um, illustrating with some examples from your context of the Western Pacific, uh, can you describe how challenges impacting transboundary cooperation have been addressed and what the continued role, I would say, because you already spoke about what MSP Global is doing or has done in the region. So what is the continued role of the IOC sub office going to play in this? I thank, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I think indeed, uh, one size doesn't fit for all. This is also, you know, the issue in our region. I think, uh, you know, uh, the primary challenge that I have, have been facing in the region, I think uh, uh, could be, uh, you know, uh, could be categorized into three. The first one, I think uh, the role of ocean and the including MSP, still not yet at the top national development agenda of many developing country. But maybe some country, I mean, very limited country, they put MSP and ocean at their top agenda, but this is not the case for most of the developing countries. So that lead a very limited policy support, you know, to, uh, you know, to ocean related developments, including MSP. You know, we know that SDG 14 is uh, one of least invested uh, goals and uh, remains among those, particularly in the Asia, you know, with the least attention. But I'm quite positive that, you know, given the ever increasing attention to the ocean, uh, I think more recognition about ocean importance and also MSP uh, will be, you know, paid from their high level policymakers. Second challenge, I would say, I think many, the distinguished speaker uh, highlighted, uh, you know, the limited technical and also institutional capacity. I mean, including a lack of relevant data and information. I think without that kind of, a, you know, the pull of our technical support, I think it's hard, you know, for developing country, you know, to 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 catch up with their, with you know the average growth of the M MSP uh, globally. And uh, you know we also have the issue are uh, many you know are uh, small island developing countries. The last but not least, that's uh, I think uh, I have mentioned that a regular regional mechanism that can really drive the MSP cooperation for long term, not on our you know short term or project basis. So this is the this is the issue that why we you know building on the existing regional collaboration mechanism, particularly I think leverage. And the opportunity of UN Decade Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, engaging all stakeholders and also establish the regional, you know, MFC, MSP forum, and push potentially, you know, to have a technical support center in this region. So with that kind of mechanism and also that kind of a, you know, framework that uh, you know we are trying to, you know, to 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 address, you know, the sustainability issues. Or of MSP uh, in this region. Thank Sarah. you, Wenji. Uh, over to Jalka. Thank you very much. Uh, well, um, we in UNEPMAP, uh, we are working with countries that have different legal frameworks. And we mainly try to support those who are not bound by the EU directive. Uh, and this means the MSP is not an obligation for them. Still, we try to support them because not only because uh, we try to, to, to explain them that this is uh, necessary for sustainable use of their marine resources, but also sometimes to create political will, which is one of the conditions for successful MSP. Uh, also, 
maybe an argument could be that we can help them in their way to the accession uh, on, the, on the accession to EU, EU mem membership. Or also uh, another very convincing, convincing, um, convincing um, um, motivation for, for them for political for ensuring political will, which is crucial, is also accession to uh, various uh, funding opportunities, whether EU or Global Environment, for, Environment Fund, on many some 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 other some other uh, financial uh, instruments. This is really something that we start with. If there is no political will, then we don't go there because it. It is a waste of effort, time and money. Then, uh, uh, in different countries, uh, different ministries are also in charge of MSP. This is another challenge, you know, if it is environmental ministry, if it is a planning ministry, if it is a ministry that is in charge of transportation, it makes a quite a big difference. So, what we try to do First of all, it is very difficult to, to uh, establish interministerial, intersectoral cooperation within the country. And then we try also to do it first at the level of the country involved, and then also to create this dialogue with other countries, because this is really important. This governance mechanism, mechanism is, crucial, is crucial for success in any, in any endeavor, including, including MSP. And for that, you need to create a lot of opportunities for dialogue, for cooperation, for uh, sharing of experiences, for learning. This is really something that uh, that uh, uh, cannot be, cannot, uh, this is condition sine qua non for, for any successful, successful in, uh, endeavor. Um, and this brings us to another, to another question that can challenge, actually very, very big challenge in the Mediterranean, which maybe seem very banal, but it is a big challenge, question of language. You know, we have different language, very, very, many different languages in the Mediterranean. So we have to be sure that we understand each other when we talk about transboundary cooperation and also that the notions are well defined, you know, because sometimes one, uh, I can understand a different thing for the same, for, for, for the same word. So this is really something and this is a banality, but this is really, really important. And finally, uh, a big issue for the med many Mediterranean countries is also availability, av av availability of data. And uh, we try to support countries which have not a good uh, databases to create them, to create new data, to organize better database. But not only that, also we try to, to, to uh, establish this size policy interface, this constant dialogue from the beginning of the process, process uh, dialogue between uh, science and policy making, because this is something that does not happen <laughs> on its own. We have, you have to encourage that, you have to transform the scientific data into something that is really meaningful for decision and policy makers. Great, thank you so much, Elka. I see Spiros is giving me the signal here that we are out of time. So um, I thank all our speakers um, and we look forward to receiving the questions from the audience. Thank you very much. I think this has been uh, so far a very, very interesting and engaging uh, discussion. And uh, although it is the last set of questions we'll have, uh, the, we, we got a lot of questions. We have more than 15 questions again. Uh, some of them have been voted by most as uh, the, the most uh, pertinent ones, and I'm afraid that we will all be punished by the question that has been uh, required by most to be answered, which is, do you have recommendations for cooperation between countries with border issues? Uh, you already said that there are some cases where you would rather not go in, in this, but uh, does anyone want to take up this question? Nobody wants to take any discussion. <laughs> All right. Yes. I'll be brave and, and <laughs> put my neck out there. But I think that one of the ways that that we get around this, our convention is a is an environmental convention. So we we try to base our discussions around ecological boundaries rather than political boundaries. And it does tend to, I, I guess it doesn't solve the, the political issues always, but it, it helps to allow 
people to at least discuss things of uh, or issues of common common interest. So taking an environmentally based approach. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, just from my experience, I, I cannot support more what you said. I mean, there are things that are included in an MSP and things that do not necessarily have to be included in MSP. So at least you know to focus on the things that are in hand and can be addressed by an honest open dialogue and not other issues that could be resolved in other fora might be a good way to go. We've had this experience also in our region, uh, Jelica, you might remember the Prespa Park, where at the time the three countries involved, North Macedonia, Albania and Greece, had serious issues to resolve. Um, in, in fact, I mean, the establishment of the Prespa Park was a predecessor for resolving many of these things that were pending. So I think that we should see also sometimes the, the glass half full and try to do what can be done uh, as a predecessor for solving other problems. However, let's not stick to this uh, because we also have questions regarding specifically the uh, interchange, if you like, or the um, facts between um, ICZM and uh, Marine Protect and, and uh, sorry, MSP. So there is one question that says, do we have any insights on mechanisms and ways to promote coherence, this is the second question you see on the screen, between MSP and ICZM, especially in the absence of ICZM plans. And there was another question very close to this one, uh, which is, uh, let me just find it because here the questions are a little bit mixed up. Um, yes, how is the land and sea integration applied in the Mediterranean management? How do you integrate MSP and ICZM? So, uh, who would like to say something about the interaction between land and sea, ICZ and MSP? I guess it's me because yes, we are Erika, talking about you. the Mediterranean. Yeah, uh, as I said, the ICZ protocol says clearly coastal zone is about uh, about land and sea so we have to work uh, um, to, we have to work on both sides uh, the entrance uh, is a land sea interaction to see how how uh, uh, how land uh, uh, land uh, uh, terrestrial activities impact uh, sea and how uh, maritime activities impact, impact the land we look at three different types we look at natural natural processes we look at uh, at, uh, at anthropogenic uh, impacts and also we look uh, uh, how the planning systems are organized we do uh, provide some recommendations in our conceptual framework on how to address all this uh, and again uh, a very crucial element is governance governance because without that uh, we cannot move and we cannot ensure any coherence any integration so when you have uh, all the players uh, included in the process then you will be able to to have integration even within, within the uh, between the, the the two planning system land use and sea use system planning yeah great thank you so much thank you so much do we have any yes susanna please so ju just from the OACS point of view, we, we tend to promote um, planning and management from what we call an island systems management approach. And that really takes the entire system into consideration. So from your ridge all the way out to the outer limits of the EEZ. So in preparing the coastal and marine spatial plans for our, the five of our countries that I mentioned, we took that into consideration. Um, initially, we were going to prepare separate coastal master plans and separate marine spatial plans, but the countries themselves said, no, you know, everything flows from one to the other. This is one system. And we created an integrated document and called them coastal and marine spatial plans. So they actually have the coastal area, the land, the terrestrial aspect, the near shore aspect and the offshore um, aspect incorporated into one seamless do um, um, document or plan. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a question that was addressed to you, Susanna, since you have the, the microphone in your hands, that was asking how is the MSP cooperation going with the Caribbean territories that are also covered by the EU legislation? Okay, so the five countries that I mentioned earlier that we have done the process for, these are, these are independent country, countries. We have not engaged the overseas territories yet on um, coastal marine spatial planning, although they have shown some interest. All right, thank you very much. 
Uh, and finally, we have, uh, I have many questions. <laughs> Let me take just one because I don't think we have time more to do more than this. Um, just give me a second because the questions are a little bit mixed up. Um, So there is one question that says transboundary cooperation, we, would, we, we saw it a while ago, third of X cutting leg of roadmap. How can all three legs support each other concretely? Ideas for cross cutting multi level initiatives. It's quite generic, but if you have any, anything to share with us. Can we see, can we, can we check and see if we have this question by Andrea Morph? Problem is that we kept the questions from the previous session, so everything is mixed up now, which is our mistake. Um, well, I think we'll have to pass this because anyway, we don't have much time. So I think that we'll go to the next part, um, which is the presentation by um, by Eriku uh, Variopurno from uh, Finnish Environmental Institute, who has been taking notes. So uh, Eriku, would you like to take the floor now? Thank you very much. Okay, directed right, I guess so. Uh, well, thanks first of all to all the pres presenters for opening and discussing this very co complex and complicated issue of transboundary co cooperation in, in MSP. And uh, well, the topic is uh, uh, like the topics of, of other sessions too, you know, one of the, the cornerstones of, uh, of successful MSP. And, uh, and we can conclude that uh, MSP is not complete until transboundary cooperation and uh, cross-border coherence are addressed. Um, and this holds true uh, for many ecological, social and economic reasons that uh, uh, many of them were raised in the presentations too. Uh, and then uh, well, the, the presented examples show that uh, the transboundary uh, and cross-border topics are uh, addressed in different ways and uh, and uh, and more precisely they showed that uh, they are being addressed in in by more than one one way in each of the given examples and uh, well it's clear that we are dealing with uh, with a complex and, and difficult matter here and uh, and and we, we really need a diversity of responses to be able to handle uh, all the dimensions uh, uh, that uh, define uh, transboundary and cross-border topics. Well, the presented examples are from all over the globe uh, and also representing very different stages of, of MSP uh, in the world, but still there are uh, some clear commonalities uh, between them. Uh, I raise here three of them. Uh, but the first one is, uh, Again, uh, well, not surprisingly, considering that uh, we were discussing of regional uh, conventions, uh, that, uh, but still it's important to acknowledge that regional conventions do give an institutional background uh, to transboundary cooperation by, by, by giving joint ac ac agreed objectives and uh, principles and, and sometimes uh, even obligations for transboundary cooperation in MSP. But uh, also importantly, they also form a, a platform for collaboration that is an essential uh, part of uh, successful transboundary cooperation. And, uh, and uh, like it was said, that, that governance mechanisms are needed uh, on regional level uh, to support transboundary cooperation. And then second, uh, uh, in these presentations, it was also quite clear that, uh, that the combination of, of formal consultations and working groups uh, with informal communication, dialogues and, and uh, joint projects have been found useful. Uh, and especially the informal ones uh, are perhaps the, the means to, to build trust among actors. Uh, and, uh, and in any case, the, the formal informal combination, it's a, it's a com complementary 
combination. And then thirdly, uh, capacity building uh, in transboundary cooperation, demonstration of, of different approaches, as well as targeted studies uh, of transboundary topics uh, and data availability uh, were, were found necessary for, for addressing the complex transboundary and uh, cross-border matters. And then uh, rapporteurs were also given an opportunity to give, give our own views uh, on the on the topic, and uh, and and I will uh, uh, focus a bit on, on cross-border coherence, uh, which is obviously a key element in, in the in this uh, session too. But from my own experience in in, in addressing transboundary matters in uh, in various contexts, uh, that would indicate that that cross-border coherence is, is understood in very different ways. And uh, it's a sort of a continuum from, uh, from uh, avoiding, avoiding obvious mismatches at, at border areas to more complex approaches uh, when countries aim to, to dig a bit deeper into each other's planning systems and uh, planning ambitions to achieve more uh, functional coherence uh, than only uh, avoiding uh, mismatches. Uh, and then to my recommendation on, on the topic, uh, it is that first, uh, when starting transboundary cooperation, it is important to, to have discussions uh, uh, on, on what do we actually mean by, uh, and, and especially what we want from cross-border uh, coherence between countries. But then I would also advise uh, quite strongly that uh, not to dwell uh, on pondering the meanings of of transboundary and cross-border coherence too long because it uh, it can be very long pondering on the topic uh, but the key is to to have to have a dialogue to find common uh, points of discussion maybe some some uh, criteria or priorities and then to go and organize bilateral trilateral or even big, bigger processes to to discuss and analyze each other's msp plans or draft plans uh, uh, to to find ways to address transboundary issues together. Uh, and then finally, to, to advertise a bit, uh, this is exactly what is uh, happening right now in the EMSP uh, uh, North Sea Baltic Sea region project where, where some, some of the participating countries have organized workshops to, to test the Baltic Sea regions. Uh, HELCOM was a, a voluntary guideline for assessing cross-border coherence to, to identify exactly those challenges and synergies uh, and to further further develop the assessment work and uh, and more testing will follow so so stay tuned to, to the EMSP project results because this is uh, really a uh, like we have seen that MSP is uh, still emerging thing and, and so similarly the transboundary practices and and, and skills in, in collaboration are emerging thank you Thank you. It's okay, you want to leave it? I don't mind. Thank you very much, Rico. I, th I think you, you managed to capture very well the uh, key points of this session. And um, with this, I would like to inform you that here we have completed the fifth and final session for today. Please, uh, let's give a hand to all speakers, all moderators and rapporteurs for this session. And before I release you, it has been a long day and your participation was very welcome. I'm very glad that we had lots of questions coming also through Slido. We had people really being in the room, participating, following carefully. So um, now you will be rewarded by the cocktail reception that will take place where the coffee break takes place also. Yes. <laughs> and uh, because you will have your cocktails tonight, then you will rest very well and everyone will be here at nine o'clock in the morning because we're starting again tomorrow nine o'clock with a session which will be the sixth one of this um, this event and this will be on climate smart msp you don't want to miss that so be here tomorrow nine o'clock drink as much as you want tonight enough to have a good evening but not too much so that you can be here tomorrow morning take care bye-bye thank you